Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Filmmaker and writer Sarah Polly has had success both in front and behind the camera. But as she explains to our Anthony Mason, being a child star was anything but enjoyable. She grew up on film sets, acting from the age of four. Did you like being a child actor? By and large, it was a terrible experience. Get the way! Stop it! She was traumatized running through explosions in the adventures of Baron Munchausen. A lot of the time when the explosions and things were going off, it was really scary. There are a lot of cherries in your pies. She was called Canada's sweetheart when she starred in the series Road to Avonlea. You didn't like all the attention either. Being recognized was, was really scary for me and uncomfortable. Later in the show, Sarah Polly on finding out the truth about her biological dad. You'd been told for a long time by your brothers and sisters that you didn't look like mm -hmm. the rest of the family. When you finally found out your father was not your biological father, how did you feel about that? I mean, I think that I didn't put like a ton of stock in DNA and what that meant about me and my relationship right. with my dad. So I think I was sort of just excited about it in that sense that when you're a little kid, you always wonder yeah. what if you yeah. found out you were from a different family. There's some kind of fascination in it. And Harry was a really fascinating person and so was his family. And mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot I was really excited and curious about. Yeah. I think that when I realized my dad was gonna find out this information at some point, that's when the penny started to drop and it started to feel a bit more difficult to me because the idea that this would cause pain. Then Rita Braver goes to the mat to learn how girls wrestling has become the fastest growing high school sport in the country. When Skyler started wrestling at age five, the only opponents around were boys. Did they say, ah, she's a girl, I'm gonna beat her easily? And were they yeah. surprised? People said that for a long time, but what I, just, happened? I just kept proving them wrong. She's someone that has broken the glass ceilings and opened the doors for those other girls. Skyler's head coach, Tim Hanneberg, says that last season, the first time Hastings High School fielded the girls wrestling team, it was just Skyler and five other girls. This year we had 18 girls in our program, so we've uh, tripled in size since last year. I already have girls begging and pleading and wanting to join the sport for next year because of the girls I have in it right now. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. The peaks and valleys of Sarah Polly's personal life, from the spotlight of childhood stardom to the trauma of sexual assault, have all been laid out in her unflinching memoir. She told her Anthony Mason how those experiences shaped her into the filmmaker she's become. Action. In Sarah Polly's film, Women Talking, the women in a cloistered religious community have been sexually abused. We know that we are bruised and infected and pregnant and terrified and insane and some of us are dead. They decide to vote. It is a part of our faith to forgive. On whether to leave. It's forgiveness that's forced upon us, true forgiveness. What these women are talking about is literally breaking down one world and building a next. The screenplay, adapted from a book by Miriam Taves, was written by Polly, who's also the film's director. You were reluctant to direct at first. Yeah, so I have three little kids. That takes a whole summer, trust me. Polly told Frances McDormand, who co-stars in the film and co-produced it, that she couldn't handle the long, grueling days away from her children. And there was this little pause, and then Frances McDormand just kind of went, well, men have written the rules of this industry, and this movie's called Women Talking, so we're gonna change the rules. Amen, sister, we're just gonna do it. I started writing it the year before the pandemic. We met Polly in Toronto, her hometown. Do you practice your slap shot here? This is here? my tour. In this country, we have hockey. <laughs> You're welcome. But she didn't grow up on the ice. She grew up on film sets, acting, from the age of four. Did you like being a child actor? By and large, it was a terrible experience. Get the way! Stop it! She was traumatized running through explosions in the adventures of Baron Munchausen. A lot of the time when the explosions and things were going off, it was really scary. 
there are a lot of cherries in your pies. She was called Canada's sweetheart when she starred in the series Road to Avonlea. You didn't like all the attention either. Being recognized was, was really scary for me and uncomfortable. At 11, Polly lost her mother to cancer. A few months later, she was diagnosed with scoliosis. My spine growing completely out of control into this curve, which I knew it needed surgery for. I think all those things just kind of came to a head. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really big moment of, of breakage in terms of just everything kind of crumbling. Was there anything unusual about the bus that particular morning? At 17, Polly was cast in Adam Agoyan's film, The Sweet Hereafter. A wheelchair girl now. Playing a girl paralyzed in a school bus accident. It's okay with you? Great. You have to do so much in your facial expressions mm -hmm. in that movie. I'd been going through so much since mm. I was so little yeah. and there was no place to put it. And suddenly I was able to put everything that had ever happened to me that I hadn't said into these silent moments. Polly won glowing reviews. In 1999, she made the cover of Vanity Fair's Hollywood issue and reached a turning point in 2000 when she was cast as rock groupie Penny Lane in Cameron Crowe's film, Almost Famous. And did you walk away from it? I did walk away from it. It became really clear to me really fast. Whoever played that part was gonna become a huge star. I knew definitively I didn't want that from my early experiences of really? fame, which were so negative. So I thought, wait, what, why am I getting on this train? Were there a lot of people who said, what are you doing? Oh yeah. If people weren't coming by the house from Toronto, they were flying in to knock on my door and go, so you're <laughs> not gonna be Penny Lane in the new Cameron Crowe movie. That's fascinating choice. Um, <laughs> In the end, the part of Penny Lane was played by Kate Hudson. You haven't regretted it at all? Never, because I never would have made my own films. It came directly from that moment. Polly recounts some of her traumas in her memoir, writing, The past and present are in constant dialogue. In the book, she alleges she was sexually assaulted when she was 16. And I'm wondering the degree to which that was in conversation with you when you were making this film? I think a lot of experiences I had as a young woman, I think they made their way into the process of thinking about this film, absolutely. Do you feel you look at yourself any differently after re-examining a lot of this? After I told those stories, yeah. I did feel lighter. I just have a buoyancy now that I don't think I had before. Has that buoyancy in any way changed the way you approach filmmaking, do you think? Yeah. I think I approach filmmaking with a lot of gratitude now. And action! I didn't have a second that went by that I wasn't so grateful to be there every day. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from Sir Polly's Chat. Something you can only see right here on CBS News Stream. Stay with us. As promised, here's more from Anthony Mason and Sarah Pauly. In reading your book, you strike me as an extraordinarily resilient person. <laughs> you see me in a good moment. <laughs> but thank you. I appreciate that. No, I just, it's like, it's like, what next? <laughs> I mean, you've asked yourself a lot of questions about your childhood and working in the film industry. How do you think you got through it? You know, I did have a lot of stuff happen to me, which I don't think I totally realized until I was writing the book. Yeah. Um, and I saw other people's responses yeah. as having, wow, you've gone through so much. And I don't sort of walk around the world feeling that way. I think yeah. I walk around feeling like I've been extraordinarily lucky, which is also a true story. Yeah. Um, so I think that helps is that I, I generally see myself as somebody who's been given a lot, not just the, the hard things that have happened. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the more I think about it, I, I do think I have this very deep unwavering faith in people's inherent goodness. Mm -hmm. I really do believe people are good. And yeah. even when people have behaved terribly, even when they behave terribly towards me, yeah. I don't think that ever goes away, me trying to figure out how they got there and yeah. why when I know they're a good person. Like right. it just, that for me is this essential kernel of uh, belief. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really propulsive and helpful. And I think that maybe does make you resilient. You've been told 
for a long time by your brothers and sisters that you didn't look like Mm -hmm. the rest of the family. When you finally found out your father was not your biological father, how did you feel about that? I mean, I think that I didn't put like a ton of stock in DNA and what that meant about me and my relationship with my dad. So I think I was sort of just excited about it in that sense that when you're a little kid, you always wonder what if you... Yeah. found out you were from a different family. There's some kind of fascination in it. And Harry was a really fascinating person, and so was his family. And, mm-hmm. you know, there was a lot I was really excited and curious about. Yeah. I think that when I realized my dad was going to find out this information at some point, that's when the penny started to drop and it started to feel a bit more difficult to me because the idea that this would cause pain yeah. was really scary. Did you, in the course of interviewing your Aside from your father's response, which, as you said, was so magnanimous. In the course of interviewing your siblings and the people around the family, was there anything that particularly shocked you? Um, You know, I'd never really heard the full story of my oldest brother and sister and their experience going through that terrible divorce with their parents and my mom losing custody of them. Mm -hmm. Um, That was heartbreaking, that part. And I I think more heartbreaking than I knew. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was interesting interviewing them about that and having that whole story finally, but also interviewing my oldest, you know, my brother, Mark, who wasn't part of that marriage, who, you know, Mm. he's these two, Johnny and Susie are his older brother and sister too. And when he talked about that story, he couldn't even speak. And it was interesting to see how a story in your family that didn't directly happen to you Mm -hmm. can kind of haunt and grieve you in a way that I didn't even understand that we are also carrying each other's stories Mm -hmm. in ways that are, traumas, even if we didn't, you know, go through them ourselves or in some cases. And I, I thought that was really interesting. Just the level of the intensity of the empathy that can develop when you've known people your whole life yeah. that you're not even really aware is there. Yeah. It's also so interesting how the way we edit our memories and compress mm-hmm. them at times and what we end up pushing out Yeah. Um, and what we end up conflating and then unwinding that sometimes it's like, it's like, it's really weird. Yeah. It's been a decade since you made the film about your family. What made you decide to, to, to be that intimate about your life? I was fascinated by the way we were all telling the same story in totally different ways. Yeah. And the ways that those versions lined up with how we were making sense of our own lives. Mm-hmm. And I got really obsessed with this notion of narrative and our attachment to it. So yeah. I think we all have these stories. We all know those people who you meet them and you're like, Yeah, so I'm like this because A, B, C, D. And they tell you the story and they've got such a handle on it. Yes. I don't trust those people. (laughs) (laughs) That's not true. Because there's also 15 other stories they could be telling about the same set of events that would lead to them becoming a different kind of person. So I think we can kind of retroactively tell the stories of our lives and reframe them in order to try to understand or justify or validate or feel okay with who we are now. It's obviously, I think creating narratives around our lives is very important. I think it's survival. I think it's also the basis of important Mm -hmm. equity seeking movements. I also think stories can be so dangerous because I think we can get rigid about them. We can shake them at each other. It can lead to people feeling they're better than other people in terms of a bigger societal context. So I think narrative just fascinates me in terms of how we use it and manipulate it, how we think we have a handle on it and then we don't. And so there was this story in my family that I suddenly got to witness everyone telling Mm -hmm. in different ways and seeing these inconsistencies. And I got really curious about how and why we were doing that. Mm -hmm. So it was a really amazing process to get to interview my family and get to hear their narrative, sometimes for two days or three days at a time. Mm -hmm. And as a sibling, not interrupt. Like (laughs) if you can imagine just asking your family questions and it is literally your job like, you will ruin your movie if you don't shut up when they say something you don't agree with. You learn a lot. I mean, yeah. I heard things I would have never heard my whole life yeah. because my job was literally just to listen. I highly recommend people pretend they're making a film about their families yeah. in order to have that experience because I yeah. think we're not always hearing each other. We're not hearing the full story. And we never will because we're going to be too busy injecting our own narrative. I feel like, I mean, everything you do, I feel in a way you're circling back and then trying to move forward at the same time. Yeah. Oh, that's a lovely way of putting it. And I hadn't thought of it that way. But it does feel like that to me that there's, yeah, this this idea of capturing the past and moving it along with you and seeing how it shifts and yeah. changes and it gets refracted in different ways. And I think, I think that's one of the big discoveries I made writing this book was... 
your memories don't have to stay static. They mm -hmm. don't, and they don't have to stay meaning the same thing they meant to you mm -hmm. two years ago when you finally came to terms with it. Like these things do shift and change yeah. according to how you're living now. Yeah. And so I've found that really liberating this idea that we're not living with these hard, rigid knots of stories that they can kind of get looser and more flexible. We can find more in them. We can find different perspectives in them. And there might be more use to them than we thought when they were happening to us. Up next, wrestling like a girl. Welcome back. Traditionally, wrestling has often been associated as a guy's sport. But not anymore. Here's Rita Braver as she pins down how girls are getting in on the action. It's one of the fastest growing high school sports in the country, girls wrestling. Here in Minnesota, it wasn't even an official sport until the last school year. Now the number of girls here has more than doubled from 250 to 541. Little Soldier state champion last year. Led by champions like Skylar Little Soldier of Hastings. And there's the pin, 25 seconds. Now a 16-year-old junior wrestling at 145 pounds, she's ranked as one of the top 10 girls high school wrestlers in the country, following a grueling training regime. At 5 a.m. I wake up and I do 500 push-ups, sit-ups, squats, and dips. 500? <laughs> Each? Yeah. What got you interested in it? Uh, my little brother, actually. They took me with to his wrestling practice, and I just I wanted to start right then and there. And Skylar Little Soldier, a proud descendant of Native Americans, now has a slew of honors. Where's your state champion medal from? Um, this one. This was from last year. When Skylar started wrestling at age five, the only opponents around were boys. Did they say, ah, she's a girl, I'm gonna beat her easily? And were they yeah. surprised? People said that for a long time, but what I, just, happened? I just kept proving them wrong. She's someone that has broken the glass ceilings and opened the doors for those other girls. Skyler's head coach, Tim Hanneberg, says that last season, the first time Hastings High School fielded the girls wrestling team, it was just Skyler and five other girls. This year we had 18 girls in our program, so we've uh, tripled in size since last year. I already have girls begging and pleading and wanting to join the sport for next year because of the girls I have in it right now. And just try and go down and grab the back of her heel like that. Wrestling is a powerful sport for girls because it teaches them how to own their space, their voice, and their body. Every time you get knocked down, you have to get back up. Sally Roberts is a major reason that girls wrestling has taken off. She's founder of the advocacy organization Wrestle like a girl. What does that mean to you? I was at a wrestling tournament and this little girl came up to me and she was so upset. And I said, what's going on? She said, I just beat this kid wrestling and he said it doesn't matter because I wrestled like a girl. I said, wait a minute, I'm a two-time world bronze medalist and if he wanted to win, maybe he could wrestle like a girl too. Like, there's no shame in that. So we took that name and we honored it and we owned it. Robert says she grew up in a stress-filled home and was constantly in trouble. I ended up getting arrested so many times I got put in front of a juvenile detention officer who said, hey, if you don't find an after-school activity, you're going to face going to juvenile detention. She says wrestling turned her life around. After winning many titles and a stint in Army Special Forces, she started Wrestle Like a Girl in 2016. Back then... There was six states in the union that recognized girls' high school wrestling as an official sport. That's all? Yes. Today there are 38 with more on the way. American women have won gold medals in wrestling at the last two Olympics, but they have not received as much attention as other champions. Fast feet, fast feet, fast feet! In part, Sally Roberts says, because of the false perception that the sport is not feminine. Yeah, forward, 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 forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's Don't right. tell that to the girls who attended this workshop at American University in D.C. The media has always portrayed like contact sports as so masculine and something girls couldn't touch because we're fragile and, you know, so it's just like, why not break that stereotype? 
And I was like, no, it's for guys. I don't want to do that. I want to be a cheerleader. And then I realized, I was like, hey, this is kind of fun. What do you think about wrestling? It's fun and aggressive. And at the Minnesota State Championships, where ninth grader Lauren Ellsmore of Pine Island was a contestant, her dad, who coaches boys wrestling, acknowledged that he'd made a mistake in trying to keep his then eight-year-old daughter from joining. I'm like, Dad, please let me wrestle. And he's like, no, no. My initial response was, uh, no, girls didn't wrestle. He relented, and before long, Lauren found a girls program. I got to actually practice, experience other girls on the mat. You still would wrestle boys from time to time, and how did they react when you beat them? Some of them would like cry and throw their headgear. But now that there's like girls wrestling starting up, they're starting to like, what's a good one for that? Um, respect? Respect. And they're not getting so upset. And as for respect, Skylar Little Soldier just took her second state title. What's ahead? I have the same dream that I'm working towards every day. What is your dream? Olympic gold medalist. You know, that's a pretty good dream. Yeah. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right here next time on Here Comes the Sun.